welcome everyone today and I can invite our panelists to just mute themselves for the moment while we do a little bit of a welcome start. We're so pleased that you're able to join us today for our wonderful discussion, exploring how Canada can become more age inclusive. And when we're thinking about age inclusivity, we're challenging ourselves to not just think about older people, but across our life course. I want to start off first by thanking our sponsors so much for helping us put on this wonderful session today. It's very, very important to all of us that we make sure that all of our work as much as possible is free to all participants. And this is kicking off our three-day conference. So thank you to our sponsors. Also, thank you to our co-hosts. We know that it takes a village to address the issues of age inclusivity and we want to acknowledge the extraordinary work of each of these organizations in helping to achieve those goals. Today, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. We are going to uh, make sure that your microphone and video can be turned off during the webinar, but we actively encourage you to use the chat box to your right. And if you're new to Zoom, you'll see either if it's at the bottom of your screen or if you're using an iPad, maybe the top of your screen, you'll see a little button that says chat. I, I recommend you open it up and you'll have the opportunity to write to all panelists and attendees. If you just write to all panelists, then your other colleagues won't see it. And we really actively encourage you to use it, to tell us who you are, where you're from, and what are some of the issues that you're addressing in your area. We're gonna be using that chat box very actively throughout Part of what we do today includes a question and answer. And you will see on your bar next to where it says chat, a Q&A. And do feel free to use and submit questions. And I, at the part of our moderation, will make sure that we get your questions answered as much as possible to welcome all of you. We are recording. This webinar is recorded. And we know also that many people are watching us through Facebook Live today, so welcome. Again, you can put your questions in the question and answer box, but when you're engaging in the chat, do make sure that you choose all panelists and attendees. If you just put all panelists, then your colleagues can't see what's happening. It's really important to know what feedback we get from this. So there'll be a very, very, I promise, very short evaluation at the end of it. And we please ask you to just answer the couple of questions so we can make sure that we meet your needs and we can also continuously improve. We know that we are raising the issues of older people and particularly around issues of elder abuse and neglect, which is a real challenge. So we ask that if you're engaged in social media, please use these hashtags as we go through. So a little bit of our agenda today. Uh, my name is Laura Tamblin Watts and I am the CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. We are Happy to be working a coast to coast to coast. Our team is all across this country, and you'll see that our panelists are also all across this country. I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes going at a very high level through the new publication that CanAge has just released, which is called Voices of Canada Seniors, a Roadmap to an Age-Inclusive Canada. Then I'm going to spend a little bit of uh, time orienting you to our wonderful panelists today. Then I'm going to ask them, in your opinion, what do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive if we're thinking more particularly about violence and abuse prevention? We move to our interactive Q&A and then there's some next steps that we're going to share with you. So just a few minutes to introduce to you our roadmap. You know, Canada has been unfortunately unique in OECD and comparator countries in not having a proper plan, a roadmap for the country when it deals with our aging issues. And we know that the World Health Organization and the United Nations have declared aging one of the five mega trends right up there with climate change. But Canada has not had a place where community can see itself, whether government can look to, and where individuals and organizations can also lean in, in a structured way, a way that makes sense. So we did that. We have six compass points, which you see there today, and we are addressing each of them in turn. So today kicks off the violence and abuse prevention, and a little bit later, half an hour after we finish this, we invite you to join the next one, which is about optimal health and wellness. On Monday, we address with affection prevention and disaster response, again at this time, and then half an hour after it finishes, we go with caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources. 
on Tuesday, same times again, 11 Eastern, we launch our discussion into economic security and in the afternoon or half an hour after we finish, social inclusion. So we're so happy that you're able to be here for our entire free conference. So we're talking about violence and abuse prevention. And we had 40 issues in our roadmap and 135 recommendations. We invite you to have a look at it, either download it on the PDF or use the incredibly easy interactive tool on our website at canage.ca slash voices, where you can just click a letter and it opens up like an accordion and click an issue and opens up and you'll see the recommendations. We know that it's a really easy way for people to be able to locate what we're talking about. I wanna share with you that, you know, we're all of our discussions are being framed, of course, by COVID-19. And we've seen some really disturbing trends. Now it's not evidence with a capital E, but it certainly is important data. And we're gonna hear a little bit from responders on the ground about whether or not they've had changes in reports or not. I, for full disclosure, I'm a board member of Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario as a volunteer. And I know that we were very disturbed when the number of calls that they would get to the senior safety line, which was usually about 800 a month at the beginning of COVID-19, became about 800 calls every three days. And only about 15% of the calls could even get through. At the same time, when we were talking to the police, they said the calls to the police had plummeted. And we need to understand more what it means to be locked up with your abuser, concern about being neglected, and, and how to move forward in this time of COVID-19 with additional complexities that we haven't dealt with before. Again, half an hour after this one, we're gonna look at optimal health and wellness. And these are some of the issues. Again, if you go to our interactive site, you just click on the issues and they'll expand to recommendations. So this is what we're talking about a little bit later today. Infection prevention and disaster response has never been more important. And on Monday morning, we're gonna be talking about vaccines. We're gonna be talking about disaster responses and what we need to do as a country to prepare to be more age inclusive. This has been really the hot button issue so much during the time of COVID-19. And we're talking about the entire health and housing continuum, everything from caregiving to long-term care, home care to housing resources. And you'll see that these issues are not conflated with health. They're actually pulled out understanding that these are the issues we're talking about, about people's housing. So these are some of the key issues that we've identified. And again, in the interactive map or on the PDF, you can open them up and see the recommendations. Economic security has maybe never been more important in the last however many years, not since really 2008 have we looked at such uncertain times. And we know that people are really trying to understand how they're gonna fund their retirement. We're looking at pension protection and how to resolve issues with financial sectors. We're talking about workforce inclusion and tax filing as well. One of the big issues that we've been discussing in the time of COVID-19, but before as well, is the issue of social inclusion. We know that older people often suffer from exclusion and loneliness, ageism, and we know that some of the key issues around technology and transportation are ones that have been with us for a long time. In our session on Tuesday afternoon, we're gonna look at also how Indigenous seniors told us they wanted to move forward with some key issues, and also talk about promoting intergenerationalism. Thanks so much for letting us do a quick little overview of our Voices of Canada's Seniors Roadmap. When we did it, and you'll see in the chat, we sought to make sure that we looked through the lens of a variety of key perspectives in order to raise issues of historic marginalization. And our policy lenses are again listed in the chat, but we were rigorous in making sure that when we were creating these recommendations as a synthesis of knowledge already developed and key stakeholder interviews, that we understood that different people experience issues differently. And that is particularly true in the issues of violence and abuse prevention. I'm so delighted that we have today our wonderful group of experts, and they are from across this country, from the West Coast to the East Coast and parts in between. I'm so pleased to introduce to you Isabel McKenzie, who is the Seniors Advocate of British Columbia. You can see Isabel's bio here, but where I want you to really focus is, is her commitment, her deep and personal commitment to supporting the well being of older people. And for those of you who know Isabel, works not just entirely in her own province,
but is often spreading the word of her work and expertise at conferences and around the world. And we know that we have been inspired by Isabel's work and one of our key sets of recommendations you will see if you open up our first recommendation and our second recommendation is to have a federal seniors advocate and for each province and territory to have a seniors advocate. So we will start our panel with Isabel, but first let me share with you the other panelists. My dear friend and colleague Krista James is the National Director of the Canadian Center for Elder Law and Krista has been running that center exceptionally, making it a leading organization not just in Canada, but around the world. Her deep commitment to equality, to identity, to making sure that intersectionality is something that we are actually living and working in, as opposed to just talking about, is inspiring to all of us. Thank you and welcome, Krista. Rayan Rydon is the Director of Provincial Partnerships and Outreach at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario, and again, a tireless champion and advocate for older people. It's been a pleasure to work with Rayan for many years, probably now entering our second decade. And Rayan has been on the front lines, in the news media, working in community, training police, and always, always trying to make sure that we are addressing the needs of older people who are most vulnerable and preventing violence and abuse wherever possible. She has been committed to supporting that work in Ontario, but as you see, she has also served as co-chair for many years of the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. And lastly, we're so excited that we have two wonderful representatives from Newfoundland and Labrador, Mary Innes. And Mary, you see here, has been working at all levels, local, provincial, national, and international levels across our not-for-profit and public sectors. She has been integrally engaged in issues of human rights and supporting issues like the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. She brings her expertise from outreach and coordination, information and referral with a tireless, tireless energy to raise awareness. And she has also one of the best email links for newsletters that you can have in Canada and I always gratefully receive it. Thank you. We're also so pleased to have in Newfoundland and Labrador, Elizabeth Siegel, who's the Director of Information and Referral Services at Seniors Newfoundland and Labrador. And she's been involved in that and involved in those issues since about 2004, when she really started to address the issue from a service provider's perspective. She's been involved in the networks at a local and a broader level for many, many years. And we know that having both of those perspectives will really share important insights in our experiences. So with no further ado, I'm going to start our conversation today. Again, please feel free to join us in the chat box. And I'm gonna turn it over to my friend and colleague, Isabel McKenley, the Seniors Advocate of BC, to address for a few minutes what she thinks we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive. Isabel, over to you. Thank you and good morning from the West Coast. And Laura, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this exciting series that CanAge is going to uh, make available to people across the country and congratulations on doing that. It's important work that CanAge is doing and I thank you very much uh, for all that you do do. A very important topic around how we can make our country, our society uh, more age inclusive and I think if we do that, a number of the issues and challenges that we face as we age will become easier for us to shoulder. Uh, certainly when we look at issues related to abuse and neglect, we look at a, a basis that uh, we form our opinions from that says what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And one of the things I'm going to sort of launch our, our session on, because we're going to have a lot of discussion uh, today in the panelist group and throughout the series that uh, Laura has put together about what we as society can do, the people who are uh, tuning in. But I want to think about, I want us to think about what we have to convince older adults to think about. So oftentimes we think that issues related to stereotyping or ageism are perpetrated by the people who aren't older adults, but uh, who are stereotyping older adults. But you know, certainly when it comes to issues around abuse and neglect and some other issues as well, we have to also 
make sure that older adults understand what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So one of the main challenges that I think we face, particularly as we look at abuse and neglect, is that a number of older adults don't recognize when it's happening to them. And so we may recognize it when we see it, but if the older adult who's experiencing it thinks that it's okay to be treated that way, they're not recognizing what's happening to them. And I think we need to start at making sure that the older adults of Canada, the seniors in Canada, understand that they're entitled not just to be treated with dignity and respect, but they're entitled to be treated as a competent functioning adult. And I think that certainly when I reflect on my career prior to this, which was about 20 odd years, working directly with seniors, working with families, being in the households, being in the care homes. Certainly what I saw was, was a lot of um, assumptions on the part of seniors that it was okay to let other people make decisions for them, that it was okay that it was time to go into the long-term care home, or that yes, this is what I have to do, or um, well, uh, you know, I don't want to um, make waves because, you know, I'm depending on my family member for doing things, running errands for me or uh, providing some care for me or allowing me a place to live. And I think that if we really, really want to, uh, to, to tackle this, the, the issue of how do we uh, get to a more inclusive society, around the aging, um, uh, around aging and around older adults. I think we have to make sure that older adults understand that uh, they have a right and a place. And if they demand that as the numbers grow, I think we will see more of that. And I think that uh, turning the tables as it were, I think will also challenge us a lot. And I think that that's where we're going to have to, to focus uh, a lot of our time and attention. You know, we did, we're undergoing a review out here right now on seniors abuse and neglect, and we did a province-wide survey. And we asked all British Columbians, what percentage of older adults do you think are subjected to abuse and neglect? And they said that they thought about 30% of our older adults were uh, subjected to abuse, neglect, and self-neglect. And what's interesting is when we, sort of go through all the various ways we try to measure it, we don't come up with anywhere near that number. Um, and so what that's telling us is many of us are seeing things that we think constitute abuse and neglect. Uh, and indeed, they, they may be. But if the person who's on the receiving end doesn't see it that way, uh, that's, a, that's quite a challenge and a problem. And so I think that the, the foundation that we can start with is to say, uh, to uh, the older adults in our society and in our lives and in our communities, uh, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to be treated as though you don't have capacity or agency. It's not acceptable to be made to feel that you have to uh, accept certain uh, behaviors from people because you might be relying on them to provide things for you. It's not acceptable. And you have to stand up and say, I'm not going to accept that. And I think that if we, as we do that and do more of that, we will find that we will step by step by step, uh, we will be building a more age inclusive society. And the analogy I would give is that we need within this, we need within the seniors community, the equivalent of the Rosa Parks, who says, uh, no, I'm gonna take that seat in this bus. And that's how it starts. So we need, the, we need to give the confidence to the older adults to say, no, I'm not going to accept that. I want better. And I think once we do that and do that successfully, the rest will follow. So I will uh, turn it over uh, or turn it back to you, Laura, to hear from the other uh, panelists and the exciting uh, session we have today and the many sessions you have in the days ahead. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Isabel. We're really grateful for your time. I know that Isabel needs to leave on the hour, and so you'll engage in the conversation, but if you slip away at that hour point, we're very grateful for your time today. We know your day is very, very busy and charged as we move forward, particularly having just celebrated National Seniors Day yesterday. It's my great pleasure to invite today Krista James. And Isabel, do feel free, you can mute your video and we'll let you uh, get on with part of your work. Krista, you know, you've been working deeply and profoundly in the area of elder abuse and neglect for many, many, many years. From your perspective, what do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive? Hi, and you can hear me okay right now? Great. Um, so thank you for this opportunity and it's such an exciting event that we're, you have happening over the year. Um, what I, what I wanna think about when we talk about age inclusion and elder abuse response is how silos of practice and um, policy separations impact our ability to respond to elder abuse and neglect in a sort of fulsome and meaningful way. And sort of to just to first to make the point about how silos of separation impact policy, I wanna talk about gender to start out with. So often elder abuse is considered a, a health policy issue or senior sector issue, obviously. And so we have fabulous services available to seniors. But then on the other hand, we have um, the violence against women sector that has been working tirelessly for um, a long time to develop a whole housing system for people across the country when women need to leave a violent situation. So we have this strong separation between supporting seniors and supporting women fleeing abuse. And so what happens with this separation is it starts to not include the experiences of some seniors enough because there's the separation. So we serve, we have a situation where transition houses aren't adequately accessible to older women. They're designed for dealing with younger women, women with children. And then also we have um, policy responses developed to deal with elder abuse that don't look at gender. So when we have so silos of practice and separation of how we do our work, and we see this at the ministerial level, we undermine our ability to include everyone. So I want to encourage everyone to think about how we can sort of bring these sort of circles or separations of practice, you know, seniors, um, gender together, so we can include everyone in our response to elder abuse. Now you see that also when you look at disability and dementia, right? As a person gets old person living with disability gets older, they sort of jump from the disability bucket to the dementia bucket. And suddenly all the services they receive are coming from a different part of um, planning. And all their relationships have to be sort of reborn with different, ser different service providers. They have to understand a new system. Supporters and caregivers have to relearn about a whole new um, world. And so the separation starts to undermine um, services. It was interesting, Isabel was talking a moment ago about rights, and I think that's important in terms of thinking about how these silos of practice expect, um, affect services. So we have a tendency to think about older people as needing help, as needing care, as needing things done to them. Um, and that is connected to the sort of health care orientation, and certainly older people need health care. Um, but they are also rights bearing citizens, you know, and I think that the um, The other ministries that are more responsible for our rights based thinking would not forget that. So we have, um, for example, we have health ministry of health dealing with health care and helping seniors and often our elder abuse helplines are lodged within senior services, but then we also have um, attorneys general, solicitors general across the province who are responsible for different, delivering different services, including legal rights. Um, and those tend to be quite separate from our elder abuse support. And as a result, we ha don't have really that many elder abuse rights clinics across the country. So I would encourage folks in seniors policy to think more about making sure a rights response is an important part of our work. And I think bringing those like silos of practice, breaking those down, bringing those silos of practice together and thinking interministerially will help us in bringing a rights-based approach to our elder abuse work. 
And then finally, maybe this is the most significant piece of, of how inclus inclusive thinking affects our elder abuse work. And um, the Voices publication does a really good job of this, about starting its work with thinking about lenses and the lenses we bring to our work. There's a danger in thinking about seniors as a big homogenous group that we forget about the experiences of different older adults who have unique kinds of vulnerability. And so what about immigrant older adults? They have different barriers to service and they experience different kinds of vulnerability and abuse. Indigenous older adults experience different kinds of abuse and they also have different needs in terms of response. And I think an important example to understand about that is we have a tendency to want to put older people in safe places when they've been harmed. Long-term care is often a choice, but for Indigenous older adults, many of whom will be survivors of residential abuse, of residential, um, of residential care and removed from their families as children, um, institutional care is, has been a long-term site of harm and racism. So if we don't bring that lens of thinking about and including the experiences of different kinds of older adults to our understanding of elder abuse, we risk not just not responding to the needs of some older people, but we risk causing further harm. Um, and of course, um, LGBTQ, to ask older adults moving to long-term care are going to experience other kinds of vulnerability to not being served properly and to being erased because it may not be safe for them to be out in long-term care. Um, and finally, I think the separation is problematic because we forget how well the violence against women sector has done at doing outreach to seniors. Um, one of the things we know um, from consultation is that seniors don't want to leave their homes. So outreach is one of our most powerful strategies to supporting seniors to be safe where they are at. And the domestic violence sector has learned so much about how to do safety planning for older adults who are living in vulnerable situations. Um, so my key message is really let's pull these silos of practice together so that we can do a more thorough job of including all older adults in our um, policy response to elder abuse and neglect in Canada. Thank you so much for your comments, your opening comments, Krista. Uh, I'm inspired by the work that you have done across different sections and historically challenged silos areas. And I'm gonna dig more into that when we move into our moderated panel. So thank you so much. I'm going to invite now Rayanne to join and share with us some of her experiences. Rayanne, you've been working in the field for a really long time. Excited to hear some of your observations about what we need to do right now to make Canada more age inclusive. Thank you, Laura, um, and your colleagues at uh, CanAge for hosting this uh, excellent webinar um, to bring to our public's attention on an important issue that's been um, at the minds and hearts of all of us for many, many years. Um, I think from my colleagues and um, that have also made their comments previously, you know, over the years, um, we all share a common goal um, across our country to protect the safety and well-being and human rights of older adults. We've all witnessed in all forms of um, abuse um, for many, many years. This is not a new issue that we're addressing. Um, and I know many of you that have joined us today have been working and responding to abuse on the front lines or through volunteering. Um, or So we know some of these issues that are a problem um, and many of those recommendations that are outlined in the Voices campaign, um, we have been saying, and I think it's important now and the time to, to take action to address those. So, you know, we've all worked tirelessly to provide the interventions to, to seniors who are vulnerable and at risk. Um, we've seen more so um, the issues coming to the forefront, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. And we know that um, these have been happening for years, as I indicated, but now it's in the public's attention. We've done public education awareness campaigns in the past. I know that the federal government launched an excellent campaign of a TV ad in 2009, 
which really started people talking. I recall, um, you know, working in the field and people saying, you know, what, what, what kind of work are you doing? And people didn't really understand what elder abuse was. And back then that kind of opened the door for conversation. So part of, um, I think in terms of bringing awareness as Isabel and both Chris has mentioned is, is letting people know about the importance, letting seniors know about what their rights are and how they can get help and how we need to work collectively as a, as a community, but also within our jurisdictions and our sectors to respond to elder abuse. Um, because we don't, we need to get this information out, not only through um, our public education uh, campaigns and stuff, but it's unfortunate that the way that we are getting the message out to our community now has been through the traumatic and horrific uh, instances that we've seen um, happening across our country, particularly within the long-term care sector. And you know, it is time for a, a change in our system. Um, and it's a change to now you know, work collaboratively to respond to those needs of older adults who are vulnerable, who are isolated, who are not being able to access supports, who are in their own homes, whether it's rural or urban areas, um, to get that information and health care that they deserve and the quality um, of the, the care and access to those services. We're also seeing an increase of ageism. Um, we see seniors themselves tell us that they've experienced um, discrimination. Um, uh, again, the priorities of getting services, not knowing what their rights are, as Isabel had mentioned. Um, and we have to do a better job at doing that. Um, I, and we have to work with older adults. And as, as Laura indicated um, with the Voices campaign is that we have seniors who have a strong voice that we need to include them in this conversation. Um, we all work as in our, with our sectors, um, maybe on front line, maybe doing um, different levels of intervention and response, whether you're in justice or victim services or housing, but we also need to include seniors in this focus of moving forward. They're part of the solution and we need to include them in that process. And yesterday with International Day of the Older Persons, we invited Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Podnix to um, send a message or a greeting. And part of her message to us as, as to seniors and as a community is that her message is that we will work together. We will work with you, along with you and in tandem with you in response to how we can combat ageism and discrimination in our society. And I think, those words really resonated with me because that's really what we have to do. We have to work together, as Chris mentioned. We have to break down those silos. And there are mechanisms that we can do that. So collaboration is a key partner, or is a key issue around doing that. We have to not only work at our federal level, we have to work within our provincial and municipal governments. Everyone needs to work toward that same goal. What our, our idea, um, in that we need to address the federal elder abuse strategy where we all are, as I mentioned, working towards a common goal. So um, developing a strategy where we can address this. We know what the issues are. You've outlined them quite succinctly in the Voices campaign. So let's bring this to um, a strategy where we can all implement something across this country that we can all work towards achieving so seniors are better. Um, they know what their rights are. They're safe. They're safe and respected and getting good quality of care and treated with dignity across, uh, across the country. So that a strategy is one, one way that we can work collaboratively um, within our jurisdictions, but also at all levels of government. We can also work within our ministerial communities as Krista alluded to our FPT, our Federal Provincial Territorial Committee. Um, I know in years past, elder abuse was uh, at the top of the, the agenda. So we need to maybe reintroduce that or get it to the top of our priority in terms of how we can work collaboratively to address the needs of seniors across our country. The other um, aspect I think is training and education. We have some best practice models out there to um, educate seniors across the country. And one great example is the It's Not Right Neighbors, Friends and Families campaign. That has been a national education program. And I know that someone had mentioned in the chat box around our, our social and our responsibility as citizens. That program engages everyone from your bystanders, your neighbor, your friend, those working in the community, um, and direct lines to engage in recognizing what those signs are, how to have that supportive conversation, maybe not knowing what to respond or how, what to do, 
but you can have a conversation to say, is everything okay? How can I support you? Has been a traumatic, you know, has been significant impact um, across, uh, across the country. And thousands of volunteers, seniors themselves have been trained to deliver these kind of education programs to their own local communities. And the impact of that goes, um, goes wide because we can get on in the rural communities, the neighbors that may see something. Um, and as Isabel indicated, we need to educate seniors about what their rights are, recognize that what's happening to them is not okay and that there are supports for them. So the other aspect that goes along with, train, with education is training. Similar to what uh, Chris alluded to, the cross-cultural um, issues that we need to address, the different silos, we need to not only train one sector, we need to get those sectors together to receive training because we can learn from each other. And one of the things that I've learned quite significantly from our um, working with our justice partners is that they can't do it alone either. They have to, we have to work collaboratively. They can do one part of that, uh, you know, the criminal part, but they also have to rely and work with us as community partners to do that response in a better way. Um, and, and we are working towards doing that, but breaking down those silos is really important. So the training and training piece of that and working to train around the issues of inclusivity around, as Chris mentioned, the LGBT uh, um, 2S plus community, the uh, ethno-cultural communities, the diversity, the language issues. Um, it, it, we have to, people with disabilities, we have to work with all those areas and train those people that are working with seniors within all those um, um, sectors to understand when they see a client or they suspect something happening, they know what to do and how to respond and intervene. So again, we also have to recognize seniors as a victim of crime. And I think uh, uh, Krista kind of alluded to that too and we're thinking about uh, violence against women sector that we often don't think about seniors in a public forum um, around including seniors as part of that they may be a part of um, the victim experience of, uh, of violence against women. Do we think about older women? It's not a common thing because most often when we see um, education or things happening in the community, we think of maybe a younger cohort, but we know from experience that older adults do face sexual assault. Um, the, um, uh, physical assault, all those different forms of abuse seniors are also as experiencing along with other cohorts in our community. So we have to be inclusive and think outside of this does affect and we have to work collaboratively together. So um, I'll leave it at that and I think I thank you for the opportunity to uh, to bring this issue to the forefront and uh, your recommendations I think do align with um, a lot of things that we are saying as panelists. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ryan. You know, the work that you've been doing tirelessly has made a huge difference. And we know that across Ontario and across, you know, the CNPEA for Canada, your work has really resonated, but it's sometimes really hard to, to keep up that work. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that in our moderated discussion. I'm so pleased to have now join us from Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, Elizabeth and Mary, and I'm gonna invite you to turn on your video. We're excited to hear what's been happening. We don't always necessarily know what's happening out in Newfoundland and Labrador. And you are challenged by not a giant population, but a fairly decent sized space to do it within. A lot of rural and remote issues as well. And you know, there's some cultural pieces that we'd love to learn more about. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and help us understand what we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive from your perspective. Thanks, Laura, and thanks so much for the invitation uh, to be here with you today. It's wonderful. We, we really appreciate it. And uh, well, we decided that we would look at the uh, CAN-AGE issues and recommendations in the Voices campaign in the context of what's happening here in this land in Labrador. Be mindful of the time constraints. I'll just jump right in. Senior NL has always been, had, had elder abuse on its agenda, ever since they, they were established first. And their work eventually evolved into the establishment of the Newfoundland and Labrador Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse, which remains a very important part of CNL. 
Over the years, we've had staff and volunteers traveling across the province giving presentations and facilitating discussions on elder abuse, the different forms it takes, how to identify elder abuse, and the different risk factors involved. Now with uh, COVID-19, of course, the regulations, we will have to uh, carry out our work virtually, which will be a challenge because we all know that a lot of seniors uh, do not have internet access or the money to buy the equipment they need. Last year, during 2019-2020, uh, we did 36 presentations and workshops on elder abuse, including financial abuse, um, frauds and scams, ages, and, and legal documents. And the legal documents that we focus mostly on here are powers of attorney and advanced health care directives, which are the ones that offer some protection from abuse for seniors while they're still alive and during end of life. Uh, we're also fortunate to have strong partnerships here with uh, local seniors clubs and, and municipalities to help us organize public meetings in different parts of the province to which we invite everybody. A uh, workshop on uh, elder abuse is fashioned in such a way as to respond to a request for different length sessions. So we have our workshops that are two hours long and two days long on elder abuse and, and the different areas that covers. Um, we, during last year, we reached uh, about 1,600 people with these, uh, with these uh, workshops and presentations. So we're very pleased with that. And also we did a session on CDC's crosstalk. And of course I had no idea how many people from the province were listening to that. And it's worth noting too, going just skipping ahead a bit to uh, in terms of financial institutions, one of our community fiscal volunteers is a retired banker. And he does a large number of presentations each year on financial abuse and financial literacy to people of all ages. He, uh, particularly high schools, he really enjoys getting into the high schools and talking to the students there. And they're very, very engaged in the discussions all the time. We have a steering committee in place to oversee the work of the network. And uh, that includes representation from the four health regions, the RCMP, Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, Aboriginal Community, Multicultural Community, and Public Legal Information Association of Newfoundland and Labrador. We do believe in collaboration with as many sectors as are available to us. Uh, the network commemorates World Elder Abuse Awareness Day annually uh, through the generous sponsorship of Verifin. We uh, get funding from Verifin to be able to offer two groups across the province small grants of $200 each so that they can plan World Elder Abuse Awareness Day events in their own community. And uh, we develop, we have place bets for World Elder Abuse Awareness Day that go out like 10, 12, 14,000 place bets that are used in a lot of restaurants and uh, uh, long-term care facilities and so on. I must add that, too, that some of the groups in the province, some of the youth groups in the province are uh, showing a lot of interest in intergenerational activities, which is a real plus when it comes to uh, helping to prevent abuse. They uh, teach seniors to use technology. They're participating in World Elder Abuse Day events by uh, applying for funding and holding events, intergenerational events in their communities, which is great. And uh, recently during COVID, actually, we had some youth groups in the province um, come to us for grants. We were delivering, administering um, grants from United Way, $1,000 grants. We went to 95 organizations. And the impact of that reached out to almost 20,000 seniors across the land of the war. They delivered food hampers or uh, uh, protective equipment and information on COVID, including a letter from our provincial minister of uh, children, seniors, and social development. In spite of all the work that we do around elder abuse, it remains grossly underreported. For example, that we, we are convinced that elder abuse is occurring every 
community and province. Last year, we did a survey of about 329 seniors across the province. And that survey showed that 84.45% of them think that elder abuse is not an issue in their community. So obviously more and more needs to be done to raise awareness. And uh, it always amazes me though how much work we can accomplish uh, through seniors and elder in the network when the network isn't, uh, doesn't have any allocated dollars. Mostly the, the network operates on fundraising. Seniors NL also has a seat on the Board of Directors of the uh, Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. We're delighted with that. And uh, we're ahead of the game here in Newfoundland and Labrador as far as uh, seniors advocates is concerned. In 2017, the first office of the seniors advocate was established here in the province. Dr. Suzanne Brake is the advocate and she has the authority to make recommendations respect to systemic changes to services for seniors. And to that end, she has been uh, consulting in constant communication with seniors and seniors organizations across the province. And she reports directly to the House of Assembly. One last thing I'm going to mention, I'm probably running out of time for both of us. <laughs> uh, actually, Elizabeth here, a number of years ago, researched and developed Looking Beyond the Hurt, a service provider's guide to elder abuse. And that was a directory of services to help older women throughout this land in Labrador who were experiencing abuse to find the help that they need. Uh, with the evolution of seniors and elves data gathering system, we now have all those services, information on all those services at our fingertips, ready to share with uh, the people who call us, people experiencing abuse, and people who want more information about abuse. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. So I was just going to say a few things about resources, responses, and research, because they're all areas under the roadmap. Um, and one of the recommendations is a 1-800 hotline for across Canada. So I thought I'd talk about our phone lines here. So Seniors and Al actually have the Seniors Information Line. It's not 24 hours, it's uh, 8.30 to 4.30. It's answered by seniors. And we take calls from everything about where do I get home support to my GST check hasn't come, and of course, elder abuse calls. Um, so last we get about 3,400 calls a year. Last year, we had 56 calls that we referred to the Provincial Adult Protection Line. And just to back up a little bit, our provincial legislation is the Adult Protection Act uh, came into being in 2014. And it is for adults who don't understand and appreciate the risk of abuse and neglect. And that includes self-neglect. And it also includes in long-term care facilities, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and it is mandatory to report this uh, rebuke abuse of adults who fit this category. Um, we also have a provincial director of adult protection and uh, directors in each of our four regional health authorities. Uh, so they have an adult protection uh, line and we asked for the recent numbers. Uh, they actually gave us for the numbers for the last five years uh, since they started up and they did receive 1,345 reports provincially. Um, about six of those, six percent of those went to investigation, and they actually only had four declarations under the act, which is a great thing because I mean, under the act, that means someone's, if they go all the way through, that means they're losing their rights and they're getting a guardian, um, but they're putting supports in so it doesn't get to that point. Um, in terms of gaps, uh, they're the seniors that I think that do not fit under the Adult Protection Act. So the Adult Protection Act is really for people who do not aren't mentally competent uh, and have the capacity to understand what's happening to them. And we get lots of calls from seniors who are being abused by family members or family members concerned about seniors. And, and the senior is aware of the situation. They just don't know what to do. They don't have other resources. They don't want to accuse family members. Um, so I think those are the sort of tools that we need to work on. Um, there are some um, violence prevention tools and tools to address violence in our province, but some of them do not have an age-friendly lens. Um, so for instance, we have a family violence court, 
and that is only for people who experience violence from intimate partners. So you know, if a senior is being abused by an adult child, they're not able to avail of that service. Likewise, we have emergency protection orders in our province and to help remove the, the violent offender. And again, they're only for intimate partner violence. And yes, of course, we do hear uh, from seniors who are experiencing domestic violence. But again, if it's abuse from a different family member, that doesn't apply. Um, likewise, our Landlord Tenant Act, it's very hard for a senior who has an adult child living with them to evict them because they're considered a resident. And I think that piece of legislation needs an age friendly or an age land, aging lens so that that, can, that situation can be taken care of. So I think we do have to look at some of the tools that we're fighting with and, and see how they can apply to seniors who are experiencing abuse as well. And just quickly, I just did want to touch on uh, research to say that our university, Memorial University, has an aging research center that opened a few years ago. We're hoping a lot of research will come out of that. And we do know that there is someone working right now on interviewing techniques for police when they're dealing with seniors who are victims of crime and again within the children. So we're very hopeful for interesting things to come from that. Thanks very much, both of you. It's so great to hear what's happening and such wonderful diversity of things that are happening in Newfoundland and Labrador. You know, one of the issues that we are often asked is, you know, who has experienced abuse? Who has seen abuse be experienced and so forth? And so we have committed ourselves to wherever we can sort of asking those questions. And we've got some polls that we're going to be doing a little bit for fun over the course of this webinar. And so you will see a poll pop up soon asking the question, you know, have you been part of experienced or seen kind of abuse and neglect. So here he is, you should be able to see it again. So hopefully you can see it on your screen. It says, have you or anyone you know experienced elder abuse? And we'll just leave that open. I'll do it again. It's have you or anyone you know experienced elder abuse? And by anyone you know, it may be somebody that you talked to on the phone, or maybe someone that called and reported it to you or um, or somebody that you've been worried about. So one more time, we'll just give it another few minutes as we all have our roads come in. Have you or anyone you know experienced elder abuse? I know that while we're waiting for our poll to finish, many, many folks are saying on a regular basis that you know, while we do as much research as we can and we try to get as much information out, of course, elder abuse in the way of so many other forms of abuse are massively underreported. And, and I'm just going to end this poll now. And just to show you, 88% of the folks who participated in the poll said that they did. So we'll just sort of share the results with you here. 88% of the folks here on our poll said that they had. And certainly that's, that's very common to what we hear time and time again. At this point, I'm going to open up our discussion and I'm going to invite our participants to turn their videos back on and join us in a active roundtable discussion. Thanks so much. And Isabel, I know your time, so I'm going to turn the first question over to you, if I may. You've been working tirelessly to raise the voices of seniors, and we often say, you know, rights without champions are always at risk. And I wanted to ask, you know, just to reflect on some of the work that you've been in this position for a long time. Let's start off with a little bit of a lift because it's easy to get depressed when we talk about this topic. I wonder if you could reflect on what you consider a few wins during your time, your tenure as senior, as advocate. What do you look back on and feel like was especially impactful in your work? And I'll just get you to click your unmute button there. Thank you. I know it's always a challenge. Very few people ask me to unmute. Um, so um, I think that uh, what I think has been helpful uh, in the creation of this office has been the ability to bring uh, to the government, uh, in this case, obviously a provincial government, because it's pro provincial governments that predominantly are responsible for delivering the kinds of services and supports that seniors need. It's really only income that is done at the federal level. But what it has allowed, uh, Laura, is the collection of data and information to be seen at a provincial level and to see that impact. So if we look at some things like care hours, for example, 
uh, without looking at it provincially. It was very, each health authority was doing it. Uh, we didn't really understand, nobody was, role. it wasn't until we looked at it at a provincial level and put it out to the public um, that, wait a minute, we're not getting the care, we're not funding the care hours we say we, our standard is. And that was the catalyst for uh, the increase in funded care hours that we've seen. And other issues uh, as well, where we've been able to gather uh, data, certainly at a provincial level, and uh, for example, uh, caregiver distress, right? To be able to say, look, 31% of our caregivers are in distress. And so I think that uh, what, the, uh, what these types of offices can do is they can, they, they can look at things at a provincial level. So sometimes you don't, really, you don't realize something is a systemic issue until you look at the whole system. And also that it's put out to the public. So, you know, on the one hand, what is it? The greatest antiseptic in the world is sunshine, right? So you put things out there. Um, the other um, approach is that I feel very strongly because it's always, you know, the sport of the day is pick on government and, you know, you kick the ball up. If you're local government, it's kicked to the province. If you're the province, it's kicked to the feds. Uh, if you're the feds, you try to say, oh, that's a provincial, you bring in the constitution. But at the end of the day, the government is the people. So if you uh, make it known to the public, um, the, the risk is the public won't rally behind it. Um, and so it isn't going to uh, resonate. And that is always a challenge for those of us who work in specialized fields, whether it's in the field of older adults or in the field of children or in the disabilities community or in the indigenous community. Uh, sometimes the proverbial trial balloon we're gonna fly isn't gonna go anywhere. But when you can mobilize uh, the public behind it, the governments will act because at the end of the day, they're the people. And that's where out of this whole pandemic, um, you know, silver linings, pardon the pun, has been the revelation to the public about what is happening in our long-term care homes, for example, right? We uh, sometimes forget that we swim in our own pool um, and that most people don't. So when you had your poll of 88% of people say that, okay, when we went out and randomly asked British Columbians, we got 30%, right? Because most British Columbians don't, uh, and citizens of Canada, I would say this, they don't, it's not their life, their life isn't touched by it. Most Canadians will never see the inside of a long-term care home. When you look at the numbers, like they just won't. And so what happened when we sent these strapping young Canadian forces uh, hyper uh, fit uh, uh, soldiers into our care homes, they went in there and said, you have got to be kidding. And many of us said, well, what did you think you were gonna find? But we've been desensitized to it, right? Uh, because we see it all the time, we've come to accept what is, and we've, uh, our standard of improvement is against, a, we forgot to say the baseline isn't good enough, right? Um, and so I think that that's, that's what these offices can do, whether they're for seniors, whether they're for children, um, whether they're for human rights. Uh, that's, I think, the impact that they can have. And I think that that's the impact that, that this office has had. Sorry, I went on, but I'm only going to get one kick at the can here. Well, and, and, and Isabel, I'm so grateful for that. I mean, one of the things that you saw, I'm sure, in our roadmap is the first set of recommendations, like, off the top was a federal seed service advocate and a BC, looking at the BC model and having a senior right. advocate. Now, some provinces, as you know, do have them, uh, though I think your office has been perhaps the most um, robust, not to say that others have not been as well, but you've been very, very engaged in a public level and making sure that the data has been involved in that discourse. I know that you have to head to your next thing, but I just want to share with you that we are all inspired by your work and your commitment to reducing violence and abuse against older people, looking at prevention as a key point, and I can't emphasize how pleased I am to hear you say data, data, data because we cannot address an issue and nor can we get the budgetary funding to support it unless we know what the numbers and prevalence are. I'm going to pick up on that. So thank you very much, Isabel, and have a wonderful rest of your day. 
Okay, thank you, and thank you to the panelists, and thank you uh, to PanAge. You've got an exciting program, and I'm going to be uh, tuning into some of it uh, later on in the next day. So thank you again, and good good day. Still early out here in BC. Day is just starting. It's still very early. Krista, I just want to pick up on something that Isabel was talking about and also kind of blend in one of the questions that we have in our q and I'm going to, you know, pull these two things together. We are often asked about prevalence, of course, and I just came off by saying data, data, data. We, of course, do have the 2015 Into the Light report, which I'll, we can also share as part of our resources, and that was led by Dr. Lynn McDonald, a a giant in our field of elder abuse and neglect and that into the light report you can find on the cnpea's website that of course was very limited by its report it was extensive for what it saw it was extensive that it was a community-based report but we really haven't seen anything within the long-term care context or for people who had some form of cognitive impairment or, or intersection we learned from mary and elizabeth about you know their adult protection legislation and, and what it covers and what it doesn't cover I know that you, Krista, have been looking at the legislation across this country regularly and trying to also think about what might be, you know, the best pieces of the different forms of legislation addressing abuse and neglect. So my question kind of for you is two fronts. One, what are your thoughts about prevalence broadly? And the second, given that, you know, are you having any insights right now with your work about what kind of legislation might have the best approaches or the most promising practices? Wow, <laughs> that's like the PhD thesis question. Um, so I'll try to say something helpful. Um, the first thing I wanna say about prevalence is that, well, it's important to understand this. It's important to understand a problem in order to respond to it appropriately, but I don't think that's always about understanding the numbers better. Um, I know you talk about disaggregated data in the Voices publication as one of your recommendations, and that's about collecting data on the different kinds of experiences of different kinds of older adults experiencing abuse. So data can have some value, but I think particularly important in terms of elder abuse data is disaggregating the data so we can understand the different kinds of vulnerability. Because mostly what we're trying to do when we respond to abuse is make appropriate, responsive, tailored services available to address the unique needs of each vulnerable older person in a holistic way. And we can't do that with generalist information. Um, I guess the other thing that I have a concern about in terms of data is um, what are we using our money for? Like, sure, we need data, but also we know elder abuse is a problem. And how much time do we need to spend gathering data before we get some shit done here? You know, I don't need to measure it anymore, quite frankly. I need to understand different aspects of the problem. But... I don't care about prevalence anymore. And partly that's because whether two people experience it or 2000, I wanna do something about it. And it's also because um, we know enough on about the numbers to do something about it. We just don't know exactly how to respond to each unique person's experience of abuse. And then the other thing is that sometimes gathering data becomes an excuse for not doing anything. We can't develop this program until we know more about the numbers. I, like Sometimes I feel like that is government and other stakeholders wait, wasting time and just creating work for academics who frankly don't often report their data to the public or government sector, right? They create data for more academics because we all have a different kind of silo practice, which is academia, government community, right? So we need to bring those silos better together if we're gonna do anything useful with our data. So that's, I guess, me on data in a nutshell. Um, so in terms of like cherry picking, what I think is some of the strong things about different legal systems for response to abuse. And maybe I'll tie this into, because there was a question in the chat box about um, mandatory comprehensive reporting. Um, and so, Embedded in Laura's question is really part of the answer that we, 
if we talk about comprehensive in terms of covering all Canada, we can't have that in Canada because the, the power to respond to abuse is a provincial and territorial thing, right? And so this is a kind of a bit of a law geek thing in terms of division of powers and constitution, but we can't have a Canada-wide Ghostbusters for responding to elder abuse because of division of powers. So if that's what you mean by comprehensive, then no, we can't have comprehensive mandatory reporting. And then the other thing I want to say about comprehensive mandatory reporting, or just the notion of mandatory reporting, is there two of the reasons why we don't have mandatory reporting is one is because grownups are not children. You know, we have mandatory reporting of, of child abuse because children don't have the right to choose about some things about keeping themselves safe, but grownups do have the right to live at risk. Um, if they can understand what's going on and help keep and to have the capacity to keep themselves safer if they want. So we don't treat grownups who have capacity like children. Um, but we do have some mechanisms across the country in different jurisdictions for responding to abuse and neglect. Um, so some things that I like. Um, what I like about British Columbia, I'll say two things I want to say I like about the adult um, um, protection, adult guardianship response regime in um, BC. And you see this in some new legislation like Newfoundland has just redone its legislation. It has the most recent legal framework. It's modeled a bit on BC, which is modeled a bit on the Yukon, um, is that it's not mandatory reporting, it's a mandatory response. So what that means is um, you have a designated body within um, the system that if there is a call about elder abuse and that kind of abuse falls under their mandate, right? So if it's a, often if it's an older person who, you know, was in say abusive relationship with their spouse, they are physically and mentally able to make choices. They might need some more options, but they can choose. We don't um, report them. We maybe try to get service to them, but there's no mandatory um, reporting or even ability to respond to abuse of this person. But what we have in these systems is there's a mandatory response to abuse when we know that that older person fits some kind of definition of vulnerability, that they can't feed from stuff. So what I like is the mandatory response. So people in the public have an option to report about an older person they're concerned about. And then the health authorities in BC, and it's, um, I think it's health in Newfoundland, has a responsibility in its Yukon, its adult protection, right? There has a legal obligation to look into the situation, to put a, get a social worker to go over there and check out and see if that older person is okay. And if that older person is not okay, does that older person fit the mandate? Meaning we take over and help them because they, they can't do it themselves. So I like, I think this notion of mandatory response is, is really good because it puts all the resources on the agency and um, it puts the responsibility where it's at. The other piece about mandatory reporting that I just wanted to mention, because I think earlier I said I'd say two things, is we need to remember about privacy and confidentiality, not just that grownups aren't ch children, is that often if you, if you come in contact with an older person who's experiencing harm, right? Like you may have a confidentiality relationship with them that you need to be mindful about thinking about how to respond. So that's a piece of how we think about this notion of mandatory response. Um, now, the other thing I like about different regimes is, for example, there are num most jurisdictions in Canada have some kind of mandatory response to abuse that's occurring in a long-term care or congregate housing setting. And that's because we recognize that people living in long-term care are probably going to be vulnerable, right? They're not able to live on a alone, so they probably can't protect themselves. And also we are housing them communally because we know they are higher needs. And so we have a duty to keep those people safe. So a lot of jurisdictions have some kind of legal obligation to report and respond to abuse of an older person living in a communal housing setting like long-term care. Um, another thing that I like, and I'm gonna mention it because it gets back to my point about breaking down silos is that a lot of jurisdictions have domestic violence legislation. And those legislation, they, 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 they are increasingly being expanded to recognize that elder abuse could be a kind of family violence. 
And so those tools for responding to abuse are becoming more available. They are kind of, to some extent, limited tools because they are mostly focused on getting protection orders from the court put in place so that you can sort of separate a vulnerable person from the person who's abusing them. But they do kind of expand our toolbox and they remind us to have a gendered lens to our practice. And they remind us that older people are part of that family um, network. Um, so those are probably um, three points that I'd like to say, but what I like, I said I could go on for much longer, but this is just one question of many, so. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And I know I gave you a lot, but I really wanted to start our conversation. I'm going to start flowing into the Q&A and blending this conversation because we've got some great, really responsive questions. One of the key pieces that we talked about here was also addressed with capacity and, and social vulnerability and housing and how we may have different responses or requirements based on that. And, and both the jurisdictions of Ontario and Newfoundland have requirements. Now, not all provinces do. And the prairies in particular don't typically have those types of responses, but both Ontario and Newfoundland uh, do. Uh, I'm going to invite here our Director of Policy and Advocacy, who's going to help us with our Q&A, Diana Cable, to pop on here. Diana, over to you. I know you've got some great questions in our Q&A. Who is the first question that you're going to address? And then I'll, I'll hand it over to our panel. Our first question is from Bridget Penhale. Great to have a perspective Great to have perspectives around breaking down silos and working together in developing inclusive responses. Please could any of the panelists say a bit more about ideas about how to achieve this, what sorts of issues should be included and so forth. That's a great question. And Bridget, thanks so much for calling in from the UK. For those of you who uh, are joining, Bridget is a giant in her field globally and in the UK. I'm going to pull both Rayanne and, uh, and our colleagues in Newfoundland on that. Rayanne, let's start with you. How do, we, how do we keep doing this? How do we achieve more? What needs to be included and so forth? This is a lot of what you do every day. Right, so, um, and I read that question earlier. So there are some good response models or um, programs that are out there working. However, there's not enough of them or maybe funding to support the, the infrastructure. The one that comes to mind most uh, at the front is the justice, uh, our response to abuse. So many people may call our justice partners or police um, uh, forces. Uh, we do in Ontario, we do have um, in some communities, uh, dedicated officers that respond to seniors' issues or support officers. Um, but when it comes to abuse, they don't only do education, but they do the response with a social worker or someone who has some expertise around seniors' issues. And we find that that model, although limited in our uh, across Ontario, is limited. It has uh, an extremely effective response and support for that older person because Often, as many of our um, panelists have indicated, sometimes it's not criminal in nature, but they need the supports that they don't know how to access services or someone has, um, maybe they're living in a situation with their family member, because I know that that came up and, um, uh, by someone just, you know, someone's moved in, maybe they don't want them to move out, but how can we work? It's not maybe a police issue at this time. It could be in terms of removal of the individual, um, but how do we better support them and the social worker maybe connect them to services for health care that they may not know that they even know or how to connect that to them. So that is a really good uh, model um, that we do have uh, in Ontario that's been working well. The other one is, I think in terms of responses, case consultation or multidisciplinary team responses. We find that both internal and external within organizations, um, within agencies, they may set up an internal structure where um, home care where they can have a team that they can bounce ideas off of that are a core member who have education training understanding of the response um, and they may get together when needed or um, in a weekly basis depending on that, that structure the other is sort of external where we do have community partners who may get together talk informally we don't have identifying information just talking about the situation around the seniors that may be at risk and how we can better support that individual with other community services. So um, similar to the um, uh, there's wraparound services uh, that we can respond uh, to situations, we find that that works well um, within the senior sector as well. So um, we have our elder abuse networks that sometimes will sit on those, some of those committees that our professionals 
uh, within the, the sector um, and just bouncing ideas in terms of like, you know, who, what part can you do? Because as we've already indicated, we can't respond to elder abuse alone. It requires our a multidisciplinary response to abuse because they are complex and they're becoming more complex, I think, as time goes on. So we have to work collaboratively um, in doing that. So I'll let my uh, other colleagues respond. We're getting a lot of nine. <laughs> Let's hear a little bit from your point of view. Hi. Like Rayanne, I'm, I'm pretty uh, proud of the uh, collaboration and the partnership that, that we have here in Newfoundland Labrador. And, uh, I, you know, we find it rather easy actually to bring people together to work together because ultimately everybody has the same, the same goal, you know, and, and our network, for example, the steering committee on our network and the network itself as uh, made up of people and organizations from, from all over, all different sectors. And it's really, really works wonderfully. And uh, Elizabeth actually has, has, uh, is working on a new project right now that really shows, I think, partnership and collaboration. Yeah, I just want to say a few words. Um, our organization was very fortunate to get a new Horizons for Seniors grant under the Plan Canadian funding. And that's a collective impact look at how to provide uh, a single entry service for seniors who have multiple needs. Um, so it's not just violence related, um, but definitely it would help in cases of elder abuse. So there's sort of two components to it. One is an interagency team for people who do need that sort of multi-service support. Um, and we've got some amazing partners because we have some provincial government departments. We have uh, Event, well, Immigration Skills and Labors, but they just changed their name. Uh, Newfoundland Labrador Housing Corporation. We have Connections for Seniors, which is a community group. It's a senior shelter and they do outreach. And we're reaching out to other people. So we're going to have an interagency committee for these kinds of cases. And I think that's really important if you have someone say an elder abuse where the answer yeah. is that they need to move their house because, you know, they need to be in a safe place. Maybe they need some financial guidance around literacy and support. Um, so it's a chance for everyone to share information with the seniors who consent and just make it an easier system for it. But what I really like about it is that we then have an oversight committee. Um, so when we come across cracks in the system and places where there's really been problems, we can sort of bump them up to a policy level to look at and make changes across systems. So we're, we're about a year into it now, maybe a little bit behind because of COVID, but we're really excited with what we're going to be able to do with that. Well, and Elizabeth, I think probably never before as needed than during the time of COVID. Thanks so much for that. Diana, over to you for our next question from our Q&A. Our next question is from an, an anonymous attendee. Provincial organizations operating often under fiscal restraint have limitations as to the scope of what can be achieved. How can we advance these all important issues with one unified voice? Well, yeah, and I'm going to jump on that and I'll, I'll share that question a little bit with all of our stakeholders. And I want to just build on not just fiscal limitations, but actually like emotional and physical limitations. There's only so much you can do. And we know that the needs outweigh the staff and the support. I'll share with you that many, many elder abuse response networks and organizations are living hand to mouth. And I don't mean this to be kind of a funding complaint, but I've worked in the not-for-profit world my whole life. And you know, I have rarely seen such incredible sets of needs and I have been challenged to understand often why funding is going the opposite direction as opposed to it. Is it, you know, Krista, Rayanne, Mary, Elizabeth, is it a combination of kind of what Isabel was talking about, like someone else's problems? Is it because it doesn't live within the right place? Um, how do you think we can strategize, I'm going to ask this in two parts, around sort of the, the fiscal piece, how do we keep our networks going? Huh? $100,000 question. No. Absolutely. And then the other piece I just wanted to share was that unified voice piece. And maybe I'll just ask Rayanne that second piece first, because this builds on some previous conversations we're having. Rayanne, pulling out that question of unified voices, do you have any thoughts about how we can share that? And then building off of that, do you think that will help in any way with getting sustaining funding, or is that a separate question? 
Yeah, no, thank you. And, and I think it just sort of builds on my first comment around, you know, even having a federal LDB strategy that we, that unified voices is that we're talking at the same, same issues and we have the same common goal at both the, at the federal, provincial and municipal level. Um, we, there are many programs at all levels and we have to work across ministries, I think as Krista mentioned as well. Um, everybody has a stake in the issue. So uh, whether that's um, you know, justice or health, um, we, or they may be all be affected by it. So we need to have that collective unify, unified voice. And if we have a strategy that gives us that sort of similar to the voices that compass to say, this is what we need to do. And I don't mean about data collection because I do agree with the comment about data. We know it's a problem. I mentioned that in my very beginning opening remarks. This has been an issue for years. Let's move it ahead. Let's fund it as we have for other sectors, including child, youth, women. Why is seniors issues not as at the higher priority of funding at the that all the other programs may be um, funded at. So um, we also have an aging population. You no know, seniors are outnumbering the youth in our in our demographics. So this is a time we need to invest to ensure that seniors not only now but in the future are protected. No, we have the programs and with the resources. And one of the things I think that we come across, not only within Ontario, but across our country is the resources on the front line, the services and interventions. So similar to many programs, I think uh, and Newfoundland talk about a new horizon, many of our networks rely on grant to grant. The sustainability um, of some of the work that's being done on the front line is somewhat difficult for them to continue because it may end after a year and then what, right? So having some sustainable um, structure and organization with a, some sort of a strategy can move that agenda ahead and know that there's a long-term commitment as opposed to the short term, although there's very successful impact in our communities from those the projects that are implemented, we need a long-term, not just sort of short snippets of, of the uh, programs and, and education that we can do. Um, we need it to go far. You know, at our municipal levels and provincially and Canada-wide and globally, we have our age-friendly communities that are funded. We tie into that. If you think about that global structure of age-friendly, um, those, you know, those pillar, pil, um, pillars of the, um, the that, that network or the infrastructure principles tie into elder abuse prevention. So, we, you know, there's many ways that we can fit this into other um, programs that are out there that are functioning well from a structural funding point of view. We just need to make it, we just need to make it happen. Thanks so much. I mean, yeah, I think what I'm going to do at this point, we have one more poll that we're going to close with. I note our time and I want to make sure that we get a chance to do this last poll. So you should see on your screen, do you think we should have a seniors advocate for Canada? This is a federal questions, so not provincial and territorial. Do you think we should have a seniors advocate for Canada? You'll know that when you have a chance to look at our voices recommendations and our map, that is one of the things that we're talking about. Certainly other countries have it as well, um, and some don't. So the question we're posing in our poll today is, do you think that we should have a seniors advocate for Canada? And I'm going to close our poll off now. Let me just share you the results. We have 89% of participants who said yes, and three people said maybe. So that is a pretty strong set of responses. And we'll use that. We'll continue to ask those polls more broadly as we go through. I am going to now just share my screen one more time. And, and in my concluding remarks, I want to really thank our panel today. And I'll invite you to stay on the screen as we do so. So we've been asking ourselves, you know, what can we do to be more age inclusive with regards to abuse and neglect? And I know that there's some questions that we will have to get to um, asynchronously, but we will do so. That's the great thing about Facebook Live and some of the other ways that we're able to do it. We will be reaching back to you. We hope that this is just part of our conversation and we invite you to participate and also to share this on your YouTube channel because it will be posted there as well. Again, please make sure that you take some action, download a copy of Voices, and also you can interact with it online. 
We also are pleased to say that Help Age Canada is moving forward with creating a resource to allow people to donate to some of these causes. We heard about the challenges of fiscal limitations and we're delighted to see that philanthropy is starting to think about how they can be involved. So more on that later, but an exciting initiative from our friends and co-presenters. Please join CanAge, it's free. You'll get newsletters, you'll get great update and information, but we can't reach out to you unless you let us know that we can do that. So please take just a minute and hit canage.ca slash join, sign up so that we can reach out to you and you can be a member of our great organization. You got a quick little break coming up and it's not too long from now. So Eastern time, it's 1 p.m. Mountain time, 11. And for those of you on the beautiful West Coast, it's 10 a.m. So we've got a little bit of a break in between until we continue on with our second part of our free online conference today. And who will you see? It's a rock star list. And again, coast to coast, we've got Dr. Nathan Stahl, who's been a really outspoken advocate in uh, as a geriatrician with regards to issues of long-term care and health and and how the geriatric health profession can be involved. John Muscadere is the head of the Canadian Frailty Network and he's going to be talking about that. Sherry Dalkey is coming for the University of Alberta and she's going to be talking about ageism and how some of the work that she's been doing has been showing some really interesting results about how ageism or breaking down ageism can affect health care provision for older people. And Dr. Karen Kobayashi will be focusing on ethnocultural issues with ethno optimal health and wellness, speaking also a little bit about innovation in health and well-being for an aging population, as well as some issues on mental health. Again, this is just day one of our conference. Don't forget to tune in on Monday for our infection prevention and disaster response. Our network, again, is a rock star list. And I particularly wanted to call out to David Cornish, who's the uh, current executive director of the David Suzuki Foundation, but is the incoming global director general of Médecins Sans Frontières. He's going to be talking about this from a, a really interesting perspective of disaster responses. Greg Shaws and, uh, and Dr. Kuman and Wilson will be talking about infection prevention and Umberto Leone will bring a lived experience perspective to it and speak about it from a pharmacist point of view. We're going to move to caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing, something we've been so focused on during this time of COVID-19. And again, we have a rock star list, people who are speaking about, you know, the experience of residents, folks calling in from Nunavut and up from uh, Northern Ontario. And then we brought to you a trio of people who are working in the Ontario sector because we're going to push them and pull them a little bit so that they're all able to talk about it together. Rachel Blaney is up in Campbell River, Comox area, and she's the former seniors critic and current whip of the federal NDP. We're going to hear from her as well. And our last sessions are on economic security, where we review everything from how to stay out of debt and consumer issues for seniors. We're going to talk about pensions, regulation, and how to resolve problems with your banks. And social inclusion is such an important piece. And on our last day on Tuesday afternoon, we're going to talk about libraries, United Way Better at Home program, the amazing responses that Help Age Canada has. We're going to talk about digital literacy. We're going to talk about home share programs. And so please don't miss that. Again, here's all the links to the organization. All of these resources will be available to you on our website and sent to you. Please follow us on our social so we can be in contact with you. We're really excited to have you and your participation. Sharing this information is one of the things we can all do without much cost. And we know that we need to spread the word and raise awareness. Elder abuse is one of those areas that we have a really hard time, you know, getting the information out. So this is a great opportunity. But really, thank you for joining us today. It's been wonderful having you with us. And please feel free to reach out at any time. This concludes our session on violence and abuse prevention. Thank you to all of our panelists today for your expertise and your engagement. And we'll also follow up with some of those offline questions to you if you had a chance to send them in. Signing off right now. Thank you, Krista, Rayanne, Mary, and Elizabeth. Have a wonderful rest of your day and continue all of your fantastic work. Goodbye, everybody.